how would you like uh, me to address you? Uh, how would you like Prem Ji? Prem Ji or Mr. Prakash? Whatever. Prem Ji is okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I read the English book thoroughly and enjoyed it immensely. It's not uh, just the personal memoirs of a veteran journalist, it's more than that. It's an eyewitness account of modern Indian history. The landmark moments, the great historic experiences, somebody who has gone through all of them, watched them closely, recorded and documented them for posterity, all that is in this book. Great moments, great characters run through the book. But what touched me most, what moved me most, and I would love Premji to talk a little bit more about it, is of the many adventures that he records from days before partition to right now, that one experience after partition, when Lala Hansrad Soni's library was brought from Rawalpindi to Delhi on an RAF plane for foreign broadcasters. These great moments when books travel at dramatic moments of history beyond borders, terrible borders, horrible borders, and adventures, adventures of ideas moving, books moving. That is something that touched me most in this book. So would Premji talk a little bit more and share with this audience that wonderful story, really. fortunate that uh, I was there at that moment. I was a young boy when uh, the partition came about, but I was grown up enough to see what was happening. And my father was very active. So I've seen the horrors of partition and the joy and awe with which India waited for independence. How at night, my mother prepared special sweets and food and everybody sat around the radio to listen to Panditji or Panditjwala Nehru's uh, speech. They were our founding fathers. He was not just a, as I, I always explained to my friends, he was not just a prime minister. He was one of the founding fathers. And the great address he gave at that cogent moment to inspire India and bring it together. And what happened later on, millions on the move. Uh, those are the things that one cannot forget, those who have seen that, witnessed it. Some of my family's relatives were killed in West Punjab. Others were lucky to have arrived. We had a small flat at that time in Thanot Place, New Delhi, uh, in a building, tropical building, which was uh, built by Netaji's uh, company at that time, earlier on. And uh, it had a great roof. And August is really wet month, but somehow that month was not that wet. So everybody would sleep out in the open. And something like maybe 40 or more or less likely, persons were there from first Punjab who came to our house in two rooms. Ladies would be preparing meals that and we lived through it. And it's nice to see all of them doing well today. And we have moved on. Country has done well. And I've seen it all and I've tried to bring it out in the book. And I hope you all read it. And I'm very privileged to say that, uh, thank uh, Prabha Kazan Foundation, 
that the thought of uh, uh, when, when he read the book, he thought of translating it, having it translated and published in uh, Bengali version. I'm very grateful to him because uh, uh, again, Calcutta is one city I have loved. I spent a lot of time here. I was here for a long period during the uh, liberation of uh, Bangladesh. I have been very lucky that I survived all that because I used to cross into East Pakistan and you know what that meant. So I am here before you now to answer any questions that you have, sir. I would rather read out that little bit of a portion, the portion that I love the most. Uh, Premji was already in Delhi when the partition took place and the refugees started arriving. Not the abstraction of refugees, close relations, friends. Among the flood of arrivals were all our relatives from Rawalpindi. Our small flat in Connor Place was suddenly cramped with relatives. Since it was summer, everyone could sleep on the terrace in the open. We had a huge terrace and lots of cots. One of the families staying with us was that of my father's uncle, Lala Hansraj Soni, who was a leading advocate in Rawalpindi. We all managed extremely well. Mother and the other women would cook food, and everybody was in good humor, even though many had left their own old lives behind. Lala Hansraj Soni had left behind his prized possession, his entire library. He was hoping to go back one day, which, as was now clear, was never going to happen. But the Royal Air Force was helping evacuate people from West Pakistan, and it so happened that my father and my cousin were covering this airlift for foreign broadcasters. My father was able to hitch a ride on an RAF plane to Royal Pende for him and his uncle to bring back whatever they could. I was told that when they got to the house in Rawalpindi, they found it occupied by a friend of Sony Sahab, who was shocked to see them. He was not happy, but could not refuse them entry, so they were able to bring back a few trunk loads of books. They were so heavy that one of the RAF officers asked my father, hey, hey, what have you got there? Stones or what? And that's how Sony Sahab's library came back to New Delhi. Now, these are dramatic moments and experiences that they get lost in the larger histories of great figures, great happenings. And Premji has gone through all these. And one of his favorite characters a character that he came to know closely beyond official barriers and different kinds of constraints was Jawaharlal Nehru. So I'd love Premji to talk a little about Nehru, the personal Nehru, the man Nehru, the Nehru who allowed a young journalist to come so close to him and share information, and ideas, news, the truth with them. When I got uh, accredited, I was just about, uh, I just turned 21. I was like this, not like this. <laughs> so, uh, it was a, getting accreditation, doing things was very, very easy. The country was very innocent. It had just become free. There were not as many rules, regulations, and God knows what, with which we have bound ourselves today. So uh, he was a young lad who gets accredited, and I go to meet uh, the uh, information officer of the Prime Minister in the Press Information Bureau and requested him if I could, could do some a photo feature on his, uh, how he spends a day. Oh, he said, okay, I'll pass on your request. 
Everything was positive those days. And uh, then he made an appointment for me to go to the house to meet the staff. When I arrived there, there was a gentleman named uh, Yashpal Kapoor. And another person I recognized was Bimla Sindhi. They, they had come from West uh, Pakistan. He welcomed me, Aja Bache, come along, child, with affection, and asked me to wait. So, till the Prime Minister comes. When the Prime Minister came, he introduced me. Pandaji had a, one amusing look at me and simply told the staff, look after him, iska dhyan rakho, iska dhyan rakho. I never forgotten those words. So, that's my first experience of him. It took me what should have been one day, it took me about three months or a little more before I could get anything. I used to go there every day. Then, by that time, I became, became part of the household. And uh, I must say, uh, I learnt a lot from there, particularly watching him. What a man! How much work he did! What kind of planning! You name it! And I hope one day soon I am able to do justice and maybe write something on Nehru era. Because he was a man who was independence movement that promised to reform the agriculture. And what quick steps? Remove Jagirdari, remove Zimidari. Not just that, hand it over land to the tillers. Not just that, started building huge dams for irrigation. Not just, not just the world's highest, Bakra, but Hidakpur, you name it. All those dams which have done us proud today in making India the granary for the world. Imagine a country which used to import food. Everybody is now talking of India can feed the world. We did it. We are doing it. But the foundations were laid then. The educational uh, institutions, they were carried forward by his another trusted founding father. Maulana Azad. That cabinet really consisted of founding fathers. Then uh, you name the industries. The only heavy industry we had at that time in India was that of Tata's. But Pandeji realized that there were not many other industrialists. There were not many industrialists at that time. The Brillas, yes, but they were into not that big. Not that big. So, uh, obviously it had to be in public sector. So we had new steel plants. So you name it, week after week, every weekend I would travel with him on the plane when we would go for inspection of these places. It was a great, great experience for me. So, that was the man, sir, and a man who loved India, who loved its people, and it's a, it was a tragedy that, uh, and I don't know why, we Indians have always been very uh, emotional about uh, Chinese. I don't know, I don't think we are now. I hope not. But uh, remember that during the World War II, even though the Congress party had refused to participate or support the World War II. We did send a medical mission, Dr. Dr. Kortnitz, to China. And uh, Pataji was very badly let down. A, China's policy on Tibet. B, when he expected to sort it all out diplomatically and uh, he held, I have seen it all with my eyes, and he held Chowin Lai's hand, introduced him 
virtually to the world. And he was stabbed in the back by them. And uh, I remember a tragic incident when nine of our policemen were killed in the dark. Cruel Chinese handed over the bodies on Panditji's birthday. Could there be anything more terrible than that? And uh, then came the uh, 1962. Again, people try to blame him, but somehow he believed, so did some others, he was not the only one, that the world had seen so much horror during the World War II, the killings, the nuclear bomb and all that, that the world won't solve political problems through war. But he was to be belied on that. I was there myself on top of Sela, and I was there when they saw the soldiers from the plains of Punjab coming up there and marching up. There was, wasn't even enough transport. And they were marching in their summer clothes on those mountains up to Sela. And then digging trenches. If you visit, any of you visit, may happen to visit uh, and I when every day I come down and I walk through the lobby there is a photograph of the soldiers having dug the trench and preparing to defend. It breaks my heart when I see that because that was again done by me and covered by me. And I don't know what, what would have happened to those soldiers. So whether we blame Panji for that, no, I don't. Because there are your beliefs sometimes which can lead you to a failure, but intentions were not bad. Uh, it's wonderful to listen to those experiences, the memories, but in the sheer economy of a master journalist, that Premji has. It's a wonderful short paragraph. Tragically for Pandit Nehru, the Chinese returned the dead bodies of the Indian policeman on the eve of his birthday. So, Panditji did not celebrate his birthday on 14th November. 1959. What a wonderful moving line. Even as he describes and goes into the details, into the politics of the intervention in Kerala in 1959, Yemis's first government, or side by side, the moving tribute by Atal Bihari Bajpayee to Nehru. A wide range of experiences, insights into history. Something that has a special bearing for us here is a small section devoted to Ashok Mitra, the Information Broadcasting Secretary to the government and Premji's engagement with Ashok Mitra. Ashok Mitra was a bureaucrat, of course, of the old Indian Civil Service, but one of the greatest scholars on Indian art and wrote two remarkable books 
on the history of European art for Bengali readers and a great work, A History of Indian Art in Bengali. Great achievements. But a man who remained so alert after his retirement when he had resettled in Kolkata, I remember and still treasure postcards that he would just shoot off to young writers like us. A piece in the Ananda Bazaar on Peter Brook, my first encounter with Peter Brook when he was doing his work on Mahabharata. And a postcard comes from Ashok Mitra sharing his opinions. I have quite a pile of them. And I'd love to hear from Premji his recollections of Ashok Mitra and the way he upheld the freedom of the press, risking even negative views of the government's acts, but allowing the press to go there to report and come up with that. You see, <coughs> This was the uh, summer of uh, 1965, yes. uh, when uh, Bihar faced terrible drought. Rains were bad, monsoon had uh, not been there, and in normal historic days of earlier periods, one could say the bureaucracy's attitude was that this is going to face famine. But India was facing famine once again. But it was the government's resolve, it won't happen. People won't die of uh, food shortage. So, uh, but all the same, things could happen. Mr. Mitra called a meeting of all the giants of the government's own uh, publicity, All India Radio, Film Division, PIB, you name it. The government has a huge uh, machinery under the IRB ministry. And uh, I was the only one non-government uh, person who was also invited to attend the meeting. I was surprised and amazed at my young age to hear the giants, all of them, without exception, advising Mr. Mitra to seal Bihar. Don't allow anybody, any journalist, to go in. When they had all finished, Mitra ji asked me, he addressed me very formally because he was, a, he was more British than the British themselves, I'll tell you that. <laughs> because they were a high, very high family of Bengal, great family, great upbringing and all that. And uh, ICS, of, of course, and uh, so he said, Mr. Prakash, you have kept quiet. Uh, what's your view? So, uh, I waited for a while, I looked at, at everybody, I said, Sir, I am sitting amongst giants of the information setup that this country has, but I must be very frank and say I am amazed that something that this government has not done something that the people of India have not done. It's a natural calamity. Why are we trying to hide it? Why don't we tell the world what the nature has done to us? And now we are fighting the nature. I have no problem. I don't think Bihar should be closed. The story to be conveyed is how 
Bihar is fighting drought. How the government is helping the people? How we are ensuring that the person in the remotest village gets food? And I said, I hope it is being done. If it is not being done, sir, then you will get negative publicity. If it is being done, you can be sure no one in the world can hit you. Mr. Mitra agreed with me. So the meeting ended, and as it was, uh, everybody was leaving, he called me back. And he said, uh, Mr. Prakash, when would you like to leave for Bihar? I said, sir, soon as possible. I have just been told of what's going on. I wasn't aware really that Bihar was in such a bad shape. I wasn't aware it till that time, till I heard it in the uh, me meeting. So I promised him and uh, I spoke with a very dear friend of mine, Tony Kane. He used to be the head of Bureau of Australian Broadcasting Commission. Because I knew at the back of my mind the government was concerned about publicity abroad. And uh, I, we also, uh, at that, that time itself, we had started uh, uh, distributing my material abroad. So I took Tony Kane, and I just spoke with him, and we both traveled by road, going through the plains, indo gangetic plains, seeing what was going on, what kind of condition it was. Believe me, it was a terrible state. Poor farmers were trying, lifting buckets of water and seeing, can something be done with the dry land? No. But the fact is, the government, thanks to Mr. Mitra, succeeded in averting what would have been a disastrous image abroad, but for his positive, trusting approach. And I found him like that. I, we became very great friends. He was very kind to me. I can't, so I'm honored to say they're friends, but he was very kind to me. I was very young and uh, he was very kind to me all through on anything. And uh, one weakness he had, he used to roll his own cigarettes. <laughs> this was also a weakness among many British in those days and he also used to roll his own cigarettes. So I was going to London and he said, Prem, uh, can you bring me, uh, if, if it is possible for you, to uh, that cigarette rolling machine. <laughs> so, okay. And uh, you know, these little things, human things. Uh, I thought it's worthwhile to remember this great man, forgotten, Ashukta. And Ashukta did a historic thing in the brief period that he was in charge of information and broadcasting as secretary, that he allowed the Films Division to speak the truth. I'll tell you, sorry to interrupt you. We, at my insistence, Panditji had at least agreed to set up experimental television station in Delhi. It wasn't meant to broadcast, but it was just this way, so that the staff could learn. I, I was insisting that Padiji was firmly of the belief that India couldn't afford it. But he agreed to that. And uh, Ashokji converted it into Doordarshan Delhi. And that's during his period that I would say the seeds of the growth of ANI were put because we produced a lot of live news reports for Doordarshan Kendra, Delhi on the 1967 elections. Right. Go ahead. And uh, we remain grateful to Ashokda in particular for those wonderful filmmakers, S. Sukhdev, K. Sarchari and others who created 
a films division which was legitimate, which was honest, which spoke the truth, even though protected, sponsored, run by the government of India. A different face altogether of the information machinery of the government, of the state. And it's a shame that we don't remember Ashok Mitra. Uh, Premji had his uh, close contact relationship with Kolkata and Bengal during the Bangladesh war. And memorable years when he risked his life crossing the border, a border which was still undefined, even before the official war had started, the unofficial encounters and the unofficial aggression that was continuing, and he was so much part of that adventure. If he would recall his Kolkata days in the early 70s, 1971 in particular. I was traveling from Delhi to Calcutta by train deliberately when I decided that uh, we have to cover this breaking story in East Pakistan when Tikka Khan cracked down on the people of uh, East Pakistan or what is Bangladesh now. Just working in my mind, how on earth Sitting in Calcutta, am I going to be able to cover it? My dear friend Durgada Saturday, who was the head of uh, our setup in Calcutta, he met me at the railway station. We came to the hotel, this grand hotel where I used to stay, and discussed. So I said, Durga, let's go to Benapol tomorrow in any case and see what happens. So we would go to Benapol, went there that day, then another day, then another day. Uh, a vendor used to come with very hot rasgullas and we would eat that, fresh. But nothing happened, no, nothing was happening there, it's all, all very quiet. Then suddenly, one day we found that the uh, uh, the Pakistani guards and police border, border guards had left the post and it was well lying vacant. And earlier on, I, I forgot to tell you that we would see the foreign uh, uh, broadcasters and foreign journalists come there, go in, and then come back after about an hour or so. And both Durga and I would think that we have been beaten badly. But really what used to happen was that they would go in there and they were allowed, not allowed to enter. And after spending time there, they would come back. So that day, both Durga and I decided, we looked at each other and said, Durga, chalo dekhte hain. We crossed. We were able to get a vehicle Somebody offered us drive towards Jessore, but halfway through he left us. And there was a re restaurant there, but encouraged me and I said, Durga, look, I will not be speaking anything. I had picked a few Bengali words, but not uh, fluent enough. So I said, I'll keep my big mouth shut because I'm a Punjabi, and to them at that time, Punjabi meant Punjabi. Didn't mean West Punjab or, or Indian Punjab, so I could be killed even by them. But the uh, heartening thing was everybody in the restaurant was listening to All India Radio. We managed to get another vehicle and on the border of Jessore, I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, just out the outskirts of Jessore, there's a tri-junction. There were a lot of dead bodies lying there. This had been reported that uh, morning that some firing had taken place there. Left side was a barricade, so we didn't go there, we went, drove into the city. 
I also went to the railway station because remember when I was sending my report abroad, the tendency in foreign countries has been to run us down. That is one reason why I built ANI, to run us down. So before they could run us down and say, ah, this, this is perhaps not from there, I would cover the railway station, show that we are in Jasore, confirm the location. And we came back. I came back, there was a Sadaji colonel waiting at the border. And he asked me, uh, where have you been? So we said, I've been to Jasore. And I, he said, when you told, to me, told me Punjabi, don't make a fool of me. I said, what do you mean by I'm making a fool of you? I explained to him and then he, you know what he told me? He said, you were very lucky because behind that barricade was Pakistan army. Why they didn't fire at you people, I do not know. Because perhaps what they had done previous day in killing those people, they were told not to fire at any more, or they may be in their namaz or something, but uh, you are lucky. So that's how the story began of unfolding what was going on in East Pakistan. That is, those are the first pictures that the world saw of Tikka Khan's murder of the civilian population of uh, Bangladesh. There were other occasions, as I mentioned in the book, when we were going towards Khulna. Uh, when we crossed in the border, there was a young lad from, the, from our side who accompanied us. He used to go there. He used, Durga found out that he used to go there often. He came along to show us around. But the local guy took us straight to the police station. I said, now we have had it. Prem Prakash, your luck is out. Again, I was lucky that uh, the, the police officer in charge of the station was a Bihari. And his, his station had rebelled. So he was about to be killed or so on. So I told Durga, let's get out of here. We are safe. The next place we landed was the house of the only MNA from East Pakistan who had been elected to the National Assembly of Pakistan, the only Muslim League MNA. <laughs> it couldn't be worse. But those guys were also in panic. Then you all had to be balanced, hold one's own. And I said, uh, they said, we, we are told Indian Army is coming. I said, yeah, we are the advance party. I have to film them. And I said, I want to go towards the Kulla Bridge, I'll come back. So we went towards the Kulla Bridge, and I, at one point, when I lifted my camera, there were lots of people coming escaping from there. They raised their hands. They thought somebody had pointed a gun at them. Anyway, we just, having done all the work there, gone up to the that side, we are we coming back, they told the driver, we are taking the driver of the, and the jeep of the MNA, uh, take us to the, back to the border. He said, no, 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 no. I have to take you to the uh, uh, house. At that point, Bantu, this is the young man who, uh, I have not forgotten his name. Pet name was Bantu, I don't know what his whole name was. Don't remember. Bantu told him, you see this bag? You see what is inside? I'll blow you up alive here and we'll drive your jeep ourselves. So drop us there. Close survival. That's how the story of uh, fight by Mukti Bahini, f atrocities inside East Pakistan were seen by the world which changed the opinion totally towards us when India was ready to 
लिबरेट कर वन लास्ट क्वेश्चन एंड देन विल हैव अबाउट टेन और फिफ्टीन मिनट्स ऑफ प्रेम जी रिस्पॉन्डिंग टू योर क्वेश्चन towards the close of uh, his book he comes to the modi years after the nehru years the indira gandhi lal bahadur shastri years beautifully recorded and documented the indira gandhi years all the different prime ministers and uh, he closes his book a short section on the modi years he talks about the crisis that followed the demonetization and various other factors but closes on a very optimistic note quite assured that modi ji with his massive support from the people and the success in political power that is shown over the last few years he will settle things on a very optimistic note he closes and just a few pages before that he recalls the sanjay gandhi years i'll read out and then the question with a short while in the sanjay gandhi years the authorities started working on strange things like the beautification of delhi it began with the jama masjid bulldozers were brought there to evict small shopkeepers from the area around jama masjid surinder and i went there to cover it the government did nothing to ensure the poor vendors were given time to salvage the goods it was shocking bulldozers destroyed shops without giving shop owners a chance to remove their stock these were poor people with very small businesses what kind of beautification drive was this the story reached the censors we gave it the slug beautification of delhi though the footage was of demolition the story was cleared however because the censors thought it was a positive story something that won't happen now so prem ji where and how do you stick your Where and how you stick your hope that things will be solved and turn to the better. You see, the greatest thing is our people. What I have seen and what Pandit Ji did before he passed away, not only the Constitution of India was passed, but we had three elections. and three general elections under guidance of pandit ji met the people of india came to know that the country belongs to them the government belongs to them and they have to elect the government it's not going to be possible for that's what i hope and pray is not going to be possible ever for any dictator to try and uh, damage us or undo our constitution or do anything to that that is the greatest hope which is the our own people and old system and we have held on to it we have held on to it and uh, that's it i mean uh, is there anything any specific you have in mind thank you pete 